Okay, we're skipping section 2.4 and jumping straight to section 2.5, and I'm going to try to do this all in one video. We're talking about continuity, which I talked about intuitively before, but let's talk about it strictly mathematically. So the definition is this. A function f of x is continuous at c. So that's the full definition, continuous at a value c, if the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to the value of the function at c. Graphically, it looks like this. Here's a function which at c is equal to f of c, and the limit as we approach that point is equal to the value of the function. What this is saying intuitively is that I can draw this picture, the graph of this function, without picking up my marker, in this case, you, your pencil, pen, whatever. Basically, the function is equal to what it looks like it's going to. Now, if f is not continuous at c, then we say that f is discontinuous at c, or we say that there is a discontinuity at c. And there are three things that can go wrong according to the definition of continuous. First, continuity requires that f of x be defined at c, so the first thing that can go wrong is that f of x might not be defined at c. That's what we see in this picture here. I've drawn it so that the limit as we approach c does exist, but there simply is no value of f of c. Second, the limit might not exist at c. So in this picture, I've drawn it so that the limit does not exist at c, even though the value of the function is defined at c. Finally, the, val the function might be defined at c, and the limit might exist, but they might not be equal to each other, which is what I'm illustrating in this picture. Here, as we approach c, it looks like a limit, l does exist. However, the value of the function at c, for some reason, is up here, f of c, which is bigger than l. Now, there are three basic kinds of discontinuities that we tend to run into in calculus. And these are called removable, infinite, and jump. A removable discontinuity occurs when the limit at c actually does exist. For example, with the function x squared minus 1 over x minus 1 at c equal to 1. This function is not defined at x equal to 1. However, the limit as we approach 1 does exist and is equal to 2. It's called removable because I could just redefine the function at 1 to be equal to 2, and then it would be continuous. Even if this function were defined to be some other value of 1, for example, if I defined f of 1 to be 3, I could make it cont uh, continuous by redefining f of 1 to be 2. Okay, the second kind we have is an infinite discontinuity, and this is where the limit as we approach c is plus or minus infinity. For example, 1 over x squared at x equal to 1, at x equal to 0, the function goes off to infinity. We can't fix this function by redefining it at 0 because we can't let the value of the function be equal to infinity. It has to be a number. There's no way that this function could ever be continuous over here. Finally, a jump discontinuity is where a function sort of jumps up from one value to the next, and there's sort of a break in the, uh, in the graph. So, for example, when I take the greatest integer function at x equal to 2, if I approach from the left, the limit is equal to 1. If I approach from the right, the limit is equal to 2. Now, just like we can talk about one-sided limits, we can talk about one-sided continuity. We say f of x is continuous from the left at c, if the value of f at c is equal to the left-hand limit. Similarly, it's continuous from the right at c if the right-hand limit is equal to f of c. For example, if I take the, uh, the greatest integer function, this is continuous from the right at c equal to 2. The limit from the right, as we approach from the right, the function is constantly equal to 2, and it approaches 2. And the greatest integer of 2 is also equal to 2, according to the graph. If I come from the left, I'm approaching 1, so it's not going to be continuous from the left. Okay, we can also talk about continuity on an interval. So a function f of x is continuous on an interval i if the function is continuous for all values c in the interval i. In particular, though, we have to be careful at endpoints. So if the function is undefined for values of x that are less than c, so that means that the function is not, we stop at c, and then there's nothing to the left, that means we only need right continuity at c. We only care if it's continuous from the right. Similarly, if f of x is undefined for x greater than c, that is, the graph stops at c, and there's nothing to the right, 
then we only need left continuity to see. So for example, let's show that the function f of x, which is 1 minus the square root of 1 minus x squared, is continuous on the interval from negative 1 to 1, closed at both endpoints. This is actually the domain of this function. So for c, between negative 1 and 1, the limit as x approaches c of 1 minus the square root of 1 minus x squared is, well, the second limit law we have says that I can break up a difference inside of a limit into the difference of limits. Then the limit of a constant, according to rule number 7, is itself. And rule number 11 says that the limit of a square root of an expression is the square root of the limit. Finally, we have the direct substitution property, which says if I have a polynomial like 1 minus x squared, I can just plug in the value, which is c, get 1 minus the square root of 1 minus c squared, which is equal to f of c. Okay, let's continue. We still have to worry about the endpoints at negative 1 and 1. Well, when c is equal to negative 1, f of x is undefined for x less than negative 1. I can't plug in a number that's less than negative 1 into here, because then x squared is going to be bigger than 1, 1 minus x squared will be less than 0, and I can't take the square root. So all I care about is continuity from the right. So instead of evaluating the limit as x goes to negative 1, I just take negative 1 from the right, and I run through the same steps as I did before. It's virtually identical to the computation when we're looking at values of c between negative 1 and 1. Except at the end of the day, I get an exact value, 1 minus the square root of 0, which is 1, and you can check that if you plug in negative 1 into this function, you get 1. I'll let you do the computation uh, when c is equal to 1. Which side does it need to be continuous from when c is equal to 1? Well, figure that out, run through the computation, see how that goes. Okay, here's the picture though. This is y is f of x. As you see, I could draw it without picking up my pencil from negative 1 to 1. It just looks like an uh, uh, Sort of smile, it's actually an upside down semicircle. You might not be able to tell it from this picture, it's supposed to be symmetric. But, anyways, great. So, this is continuous in between negative 1 and 1. It's a solid line. As I go to negative 1, I'm approaching this point from the right. So, I go to 1, I'm approaching this point from the left. And I don't care that it's undefined to the left of negative 1 or to the right of 1.